Here, something that's going to break your brain a little bit. The code editor you're probably using right now. The one running on your desktop that feels fast and native and professional. It's literally a web browser. I'm not exaggerating. VS Code is Google Chrome wearing a trench coat, pretending to be a desktop app, and somehow, against all logic, it became the most popular code editor on the planet, used by over 70% of developers. How? How did Microsoft take web technologies, the same stuff that makes websites slow and janky, and build something that feels this good? Today I'm going to take you inside the actual source code and show you the engineering brilliance that makes VS Code work. And I promise you, by the end of this video you will never look at that little blue icon the same way again. So I spent way too much time doing something slightly unhinged. I went through VS Code's actual source code on GitHub. We are talking hundreds of thousands of lines, cross-referenced it with Electron documentation and traced the startup process from the moment you double-click that icon to the moment your cursor is blinking in an editor. And what I found wasn't just interesting from a oh, it is neat perspective, it's a masterclass in software architecture. The decisions Microsoft made here, they solve problems that every developer faces. But before we dive into the technical stuff, we need to start with the fundamental question that everything else depends on. Why would anyone build a code editor out of web technologies in the first place? Okay, so let's talk about Electron, because understanding Electron is understanding VS Code. Here's the simple version. Electron lets you build desktop apps using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Instead of learning C++ or Swift or whatever, you use web technologies. But wait, you're thinking web apps are slow, they eat RAM for breakfast, why would you do that? And honestly, that was my reaction too. But here's what I didn't understand until I really dug in. Electron isn't just Chrome in a window, it's actually two things smashed together. Number one, a stripped down version of Chromium. That's an open source engine that powers Chrome, Edge and Brave. This handles all the UI rendering. Number two, Node.js, a way to run JavaScript that has access to your actual computer, files, processes, network and everything. Here's where the genius starts. In a normal web browser, JavaScript runs in a sandbox. It can't touch your files. It can't run system commands. That's a security feature. You don't want random websites accessing your hard drive. But the code editor needs to access your files, it needs to run terminal commands, it needs to do things that websites can't do. Electron solves this by running Node.js alongside Chromium. Your UI is a web technology, fast to develop, easy to make look, look good, but behind the scenes Node.js handles all the heavy lifting with your actual computer. Now here's where most explanations stop. They say Electron combines Chromium and Node, and move on. But that's like saying a car combines an engine and wheels. Technically true, completely useless. The real question is, how do these pieces actually talk to each other? And this is where P VS Code's architecture gets genuinely clever. When you launch VS Code, you're not starting one program. You're starting an entire family of processes. The main process, this is the parent. It runs Node.js, controls the application lifecycle, manages Windows, and handles all the stuff that needs real computer access. Render processes, each VS Code window is its own isolated process. It's basically a browser tab that shows the UI. This is where you see your code, your sidebar, your terminal, and everything else. Extension host processes. Your extensions don't run in the main window. They run in a separate processes. This is huge. I will explain why in a minute. Worker processes. Background tasks like searching files or parsing language features. Now, why split things up like this? Two words, crash isolation. Think about it, if you install a buggy extension and it crashes, what happens? In a single process architecture, your entire editor dies, all your unsaved work gone. But in VS Code's architecture, that extension is running it in its own process. It crashes, VS Code catches it, shows you an error and keeps running. Your work is fine. This is also why VS Code doesn't slow down when an extension is doing heavy work. That extension is in its own process. Using its own CPU time, your editor stays responsive. This multi-process architecture isn't unique to VS Code. Chrome uses the same approach for tabs, but applying it to the code editor with extensions as an isolated processes, that's what makes VS Code feel stable in a way that other Electron apps don't. By the way, if you're finding this interesting, you will definitely want to stick around for the part about IPC, that's inter-process communication. Because knowing how these processes talk to each other, that's where the really clever stuff happens. Alright, let's trace what actually happens when you launch VS Code. Because this is startup sequence is a work of art. Millisecond zero. You double click on the icon, 
Your operating system says, cool, let me run this Electron app. Immediately, a file called main.ts takes over. This is a conductor of the whole orchestra, and the first thing it does, parse your command line arguments. See, VS Code can launch in multiple modes, normal editor mode, a diff viewer, a merge conflict helper, even as a server with no UI at all. The command line arguments determine which path it takes. But here's an insider detail that most people don't know. Before any of your code runs, before any window appears, VS Code runs a script called bootstrap node.ts and this script does something sneaky it modifies node.js's module resolution normally when node.js imports a module it looks in a bunch of default places including global installations on your system but vs code's bootstrap script removes those global paths why isolation vs code doesn't want some brand of globally installed npm packaging interfering with its internals by scraping out global paths every dependency is granted to come from vs code's own unbundled modules. But wait, there is more. The script also does something called portable mode detection. If VS Code detects that it was launched from a special portable folder structure, is it stores all this data, settings, extensions, cache inside that folder instead of your user directory. This is how you can run VS Code from a USB drive with all your configurations, then plug it into a different computer and have everything work exactly the same. Most developers don't even know this feature exists, but it's checked on every startup just in case. Okay, now here's what things get really interesting. After the bootstrap, VS Code needs to figure out what language to display. And this happens before the window opens. The system is called NLS, National Language Support. And the way it works is kind of beautiful. During Bootstrap, VS Code reads an environment variable called VS Code NLS config. This contains a JSON blob with the language settings. If it's not set, VS Code figures out your language from your operating system. Then it flows a message file, essentially a giant dictionary that maps internal strings ideas to translated text. So when VS Code wants to show you file in the menu, it doesn't have file hardcoded. It has a key like menu.file, and it looks that up in the messages dictionary. But here's the clever part. These translations are loaded into a global variable. Global this, global list of VS Code and less messages that's accessible any, anywhere in the application. Any component anywhere in the codebase can call localized function with a key and instantly get the right translation. No passing translation objects around. No dependency injection for language strings. One global lookup, fast, simple, everywhere. This is the kind of decision that seems small but has massive implications. Every UI string in VS Code and there are thousands goes through this system. Getting it wrong would mean bugs everywhere. Getting it right means the whole theme can add new features without ever thinking about translation infrastructure. Alright, now we are getting to the heart of VS Code. The thing that makes it a code editor instead of just fancy text box. Monaco. Monaco is a code editor component. It's actually available as a standalone open source project. You can embed it in any web page. VS Code Online uses it. GitHub uses it for editing files. It's everywhere. But what makes Monaco? Let's break it down. Monaco lives in a directory called source slash vs slash editor and it's split into three main layers. Layer 1 common. This is the foundation. Position calculations, text manipulation primitives, diff algorithms, nothing browser specific. Just pure your logic about text. For example, there are classes for position, align number, and column number, and range, a start position, and end position. Every single selection, every cursor, every highlighted region, it's all built on these primitives. Layer 2, browser. This handles everything about how the editor appears in a web context, mouse events, keyboard input, touch handling, GPU accelerated rendering. And yes, I said GPU accelerated. Monaco uses canvas rendering with GPU assistance for the actual text display. This is part of why it feels smooth even with massive files. Layer 3, this is where features live and it's designed as a plugin architecture within Monaco itself. Bracket matching is a contribution find and replace contribution, code folding, minimap, hover information, all contributions. Each one follows the same pattern. Register with the editor, declare what events you care about, provide handlers, the editor doesn't need to know about bracket matching internally, it just knows how to host contributions. Here's what blew my mind. This contribution pattern means you could theoretically rip out find and replace from Monaco and the editor would still work perfectly. Each feature is genuinely isolated, it's like Lego for editor functionality. But here's the question everyone asks, how does Monaco handle huge files, like open a 500 megabyte log file, I've done this.
this and it doesn't die why two tricks trick one line based virtualization monaco doesn't render your whole file it only renders the line currently visible on the screen plus a small buffer above and below you scroll down it renders new lines discards old ones this means a 10 line file and a 10 million line file take almost the same amount of memory to display the file is still in memory but the DOM, the actual visual elements, stays tiny. Trick 2. Piece table data structure. Ok, this one is nerdy but incredible. When you open a file, Monaco doesn't store the text as one giant string. Instead, it uses something called a piece table. Think of it like this. You have your original file and you have a table of edits. Each edit says insert this text at this position or delete from here to here. When you type a character, Monaco doesn't rewrite the whole file. It just adds a tiny entry to the edit table. When you need to read the text, it reconstructs it by playing through the edits. Why is this genius? Because it makes undo instantaneous. To undo, you just remove the last edit from the table. The original file is still there, untouched. It also makes memory super efficient. If you open a 100 megabytes file but only change one character, your memory usage barely increases. You're storing the original file plus one tiny edit, not a whole new copy. This is the same data structure used by some really serious text editors, the fact that it's in JavaScript editor is honestly kind of amazing. Okay, remember earlier when I said VS Code runs as multiple processes, the main process, renderer processes, extension hosts? Here's the billion dollar question, how do they talk to each other? This is the IPC, Inter-Process Communication, and VS Code's implementation is a masterpiece of pragmatic engineering. The core abstraction is called a channel, think of it like a phone line between two processes, one side creates a channel the other side connects to it and they can send messages back and forth. In source slash vs slash base slash parse slash ipc slash common slash ipc.ts file, you will find the interface. There is a i channel for calling methods and listening to events. There is iServer channel for the service providing those methods. But here's the key insight. The same interface works across completely different transport mechanisms. In Electron's main to render communication uses IPC main and IPC render. In the web version talking to the server uses WebSockets between the extension host and the main processes uses nerd's child process module to a web browser uses port message some channel abstraction different pipes underneath this is powerful because it means any service in vs code can be more available across any process boundary without changing the service code file service configuration service window service they are all channelified once and work everywhere now you might be thinking wait if processes can just send messages to each other, isn't that a security risk? Yes, yes it is, and VS Code has an answer, sandboxing. Electrons render processes the ones showing UI run in a sandbox. They literally cannot access your file system directly, cannot spawn processes, cannot touch the network. But wait, you say VS Code obviously reads files, how? Through the main process via IPC. When VS Code's renderer wants to read a file, it sends a message through IPC to the main process. The main process, which is not sandbox, does the actual file reading and sends the result back. This means even if an attacker somehow exaggerates malicious JavaScript in a rendered process, they can't directly touch your computer. They would have to exploit the IPC layer, which is locked down. Look at this. There is a wrapper called validated IPC main that checks every incoming message. It verifies the sender, checks that the channel name starts with the VS code, confirms the request is coming from a com compromised iframe. This level of paranoia isn't ac accidental. Electron apps have been notorious for security issues. VS Code took that seriously. The sandboxing, the channel validation, the process isolation, it's all defense in depth. There is one more IPC detail that's too cool not to mention. Message ports. For certain high throughput scenarios, VS Code uses the message port API. It's like creating a direct phone line between two specific components, bypassing the normal switch port. Extensions use this. The terminal uses this, anything that needs to pass a lot of data quickly gets its own message port. And the transfer mechanism uses something called VQL, variable quantity length encoding for integers. Instead of always using 4 bytes for the number, small numbers uses 1 byte. Bigger numbers use more. This sounds trivial, but when you're passing millions of messages, shaving a few bytes each time adds up. 